I have defeated thermal throttling. I noticed while testing this thing out for my initial review that it thermal throttles pretty hard and pretty immediately when you drive it with the gas pedal to the floor. Upon further inspection, the reason for that is pretty straightforward physics. This laptop has the same design as the M4 MacBook Pro. And here I took the bottom off so you can see this one. I already gave my M4 back to Apple, so we're gonna have to use a picture on the other side to compare it. But you'll see these are laid out exactly the same. So at least visually, same cooling system. But when you put this computer to work, the MacBook Pro gives the M4 five SOC more power. It literally runs on between 30% and 50% more electricity than the M4 when you're maxing everything out. Not all the time, this laptop actually runs more efficiently overall, but at full blast, this thing will pull between 30 and 40 watts while the M4 MacBook Pro only pulls between 20 and 30 watts. So great, more power, same fan, same heat pipe, same cooling capacity. What I'm gonna do today is to try to bleed off some additional heat from inside here before it makes it to the fan to see if I can keep this CPU running a little faster, a little longer than it does from the factory. And really, this is just a practical experiment. I am not suggesting anyone should run their M5 MacBook Pro this way. And I don't even know if it's gonna work yet, but ideally I'm gonna set up this MacBook Pro in a way that after the mod is in place, I should be able to just magnetically stick this puck to the bottom of it to do the magic. You see this black tube going from the CPU up and over to the fan? This is a heat pipe. And this is the part of the video where I force you to learn something. You'll see these heat pipes if you ever look down into a beefy CPU cooler and also inside GPUs. In a desktop computer, this flat spot will sit right up on top of a CPU. And then these copper tubes are heat pipes that transfer the heat from the CPU up into these metal fins. And then it's got a fan that runs to just blow the heat off of the fins. This wimpy RT TX 5050 GPU has the same system inside. If you can see that there, yeah, there's a heat pipe coming off the actual GPU and it just works its way through, you know, whatever. There's aluminum fins in there that these fans blow the heat off of them. And this system as a whole is basically the same thing as the vapor chamber that they're touting in the iPhone 17 Pro, just a different shape. Here's how it works. Inside the MacBook Pro, this tube is made out of copper and it's hollow. At one side of it is the CPU under a copper plate. That's what this square is here. This plate transfers all the heat from the CPU onto this tube. Inside this hollow copper tube is just a little bit of water. But importantly, the inside of this tube has most of the air sucked out of it. It's under a vacuum. And there's this mystical property of liquids that when they're under pressure, or in this case, under negative pressure, and I'm putting an example on the screen here, there are all these experiments you can look at online of people making water boil at room temperature. You can put water in a giant syringe, block one end off of it, and then just pull super hard, which will make a strong vacuum inside the tube. More vacuum, lower boiling point of liquid. Liquids. So anyway, this little tube is under vacuum inside. The water inside can turn from a liquid to a vapor at much lower temperature than normal, like 50 C. I made that up. I don't know how low the temperature, but it's the phase change into vapor that we're after here. Changing water from a liquid to vapor uses energy. In this case, energy in the form of heat. And since energy never really disappears, it remains in the vapor. That vapor will then immediately move from where it's hotter to where it's less hot over on the other side where the fan is. And there's a heat sink under here that will pull the heat off of this tube and then a fan that will blow that heat out into the air. Once the vapor in here hits the heat sink, it cools down just enough to get back down below its boiling point. That makes the vapor condense back into liquid inside this tube. And that process, that phase change process from vapor back to liquid uses the same amount of energy that it took to boil it in the first place. And that way, the heat that got picked up next to the CPU gets delivered over to the heat sink and just blown off into the air into your room. I said that twice. The liquid water then makes its way back down to the hot side through these spongy metal channels. And those work in any orientation. So this will be just as effective upside down. It wouldn't matter because of the way water can move through a sponge. It's called the capillary effect. Works in sponges that are made out of copper. How about that? But now I've said one too many science words, let's move on. To super simplify a heat pipe, when you heat up one side, the other side gets hot also, freakishly fast, strangely efficient, the end. And this little marvel of engineering can move heat hundreds of times as fast as just a copper bar, which already moves heat more efficiently than pretty much all other metals except maybe silver, I think. And I said all of this because my plan is to steal from it. I'm gonna attempt to divert some of that heat while it's on its way over to the heat sink in here to hopefully increase the overall cooling capacity of this entire system. The only reason we ever see a computer component thermal throttle is because more heat is being thrown at this heat pipe heat sink combo than can be removed from it in real time. So my plan is to remove 
move some more. And I'm gonna do that similarly to how I did it in the MacBook Air using thermal pads to make like a heat bridge, thermally connecting the face of this heat pipe to the bottom of the aluminum case of the computer. So that's gonna heat up the bottom plate of the laptop. And then I'm gonna use this device. This thing uses a completely different type of little physics hack, harnessing the Peltier effect. This is a thermal electric cooling device. When you give this little puck power, the bottom of it gets super cold, the inside of it gets super hot, and then there's a fan in here that just blows all the heat out into the air. And this thing's not nearly as efficient, nor are thermal pads nearly as efficient at moving heat as heat pipes are. But without any question, some additional heat is gonna get yanked off the CPU doing this. So let's just see if it's enough to make any sort of noticeable difference. Also, this completely destroys the efficiency of using a MacBook. This thing pulls like an additional 30 watts to do its thing. So now we're doubling the amount of power needed to run the computer to probably siphon off just a couple of extra watts. But I think it'll be noticeable. We're only working with the total of 30 watts coming out of the CPU in the first place. And I only need to extract maybe five or 10 watts from this cooler to make a measurable difference in speed. And hopefully I did a good job of split screening the installation of these thermal pads while I said all that nonsense a second ago, because I value your time and I'm not trying to pad the length of these videos. I added this magnetic stick on plate to make the use of this system super simple. So this thing will just slap right onto the bottom. Then it does need to be elevated off the desk a little bit. So temporary solution is this. Please subscribe to my channel to both personally enrich me further, but also to see more mad science in the future. Now let's run this bad boy through some tests. And I already screen recorded all the baseline tests to compare this thing with, starting with the Cinebench 2024 benchmark. This will run all 10 CPU cores in here at 100%. And in my baseline test, it did thermal throttle a little bit. You can see, and this is the baseline test with the computer set up the way it comes from Apple. Right when it starts out, the performance CPU cores are running at 4.25 gigahertz and it's pumping 30 watts into the SOC. But almost immediately as it heats up, those slow down to four gigahertz flat and the power drops to about 25 watts and then it just stays there for the entirety of the 10 minutes. With the modded MacBook Pro, we have a perfectly straight line. Those CPUs start at 4.25 gigahertz and they just truck right along at 4.25 gigahertz for the whole test. And the power stays above 30 watts for the whole 10 minutes, which means as far as CPU related tasks, zero thermal throttle. The CPUs never slowed down. We have conquered the thermal throttle. And I ran this test a third time with the pads installed, but without the thermal electric cooler. Because honestly, this thing will not be super convenient. It needs its own power source to run. The computer has to be elevated so that it's not hitting the table. It's just not realistic. And you should not keep this thing on here when the computer's at idle. Cause you don't want to make the CPU too cold and end up with condensation inside here. These things can literally freeze water on their surface if there's nothing warming it up. But just by putting a 1.5 millimeter thermal pad over the CPU one time, even if that can pump the performance just a tiny bit, if it's measurable, to me, it's worth the $10 and 10 minutes it took to install. And I've got good news for me. Running this MacBook Pro with thermal pads, bridging the CPU to the bottom of the case and nothing else, just flat on the table like I would normally use a computer, is an improvement over the stock MacBook Pro. There is a little bit of thermal throttling. The CPU speed runs at around 4.15 gigahertz, which is faster than four gigahertz, but not quite as fast as 4.25 gigahertz. It's also given the SOC a tad bit more power to work with than stock, around 28 watts instead of 25. And I don't know how these scores actually translate to useful CPU power, but by default, and this is the 10 minute long thermal throttle test on Cinebench 2024. This M5 MacBook Pro scored 1,055 points. With the thermal pads alone, it scored 1,066 points. With the thermal pads and the thermal electric cooler, it scored 1,083 points. And I think maybe more importantly, looking at the heat curve, the pads absorb a lot of the initial wave of heat when the test first starts. In the default test, the CPU temp in here goes from 50 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius in about eight seconds. And that's when it starts to thermal throttle at about 100 degrees C. With the thermal pads installed, and this is the test with no cooling puck, from the start of the test, the CPU temps did not hit 100 degrees until the 40 second mark. So that's actually just generally better for the components inside here, a more gradual heat cycle. And unlike my M4 MacBook Air that I modded previously this way, the batteries on the Pro are separated from the motherboard by quite a bit of extra space. And I shot the bottom side of this computer with my thermal camera while having it run another benchmark. And I'm confident that doing this will send a negligible amount of heat down to the 
batteries via the bottom case. Like, yes, the bottom of the computer does heat up like maybe five degrees more than without the thermal pads, but hardly any of that extra heat actually travels down to the bottom of the computer where the batteries are. And there's a little bit of an air gap between the batteries and the bottom case anyway. So being in a warmer room would have more of an effect on heating up the batteries than doing this thermal mod would. These initial tests were really good, so let's hammer on those GPUs and see if it has the same effect. Using the Draw Things app, and this app uses the GPUs to generate images from a prompt. In the initial test, it's kind of hard to make any conclusions, but the fans were raging once it was up and running. So it's definitely fighting to cool itself down. The whole motherboard throughout the whole thing stayed under 100 degrees. But if you look closer at the speed of the GPU, it's modulating from 1.55 down to 1.48, up and down in that range the whole time. After putting the thermal pads in, you can see that this red line, this is the clock speed of the GPUs over time. It's a much straighter line, not to mention the temps of the whole computer don't even get up into the 90s. When I ran it the third time with the thermal pads in, but no thermal electric cooler, it actually finished the render in the same amount of time as it did with the cooler. The temps were a little higher, but still a bit lower than in the default configuration. And clearly it kept the motherboard below its thermal throttle threshold, thermal throttle threshold. And that same thing was happening where the lines are all just straightened out. The clock speed and the power delivery graph was more flattened out. So by installing thermal pads on the CPU inside this MacBook Pro, it was able to finish this render 10 seconds faster, both with the puck and without. That's five minutes and 50 seconds compared to five minutes and 40 seconds. And 10 seconds faster in a thing that takes almost six minutes is really not a huge improvement at all. But it's repeatable and it's very clear that everything's running cooler in here while also being given more power to work with while doing the hard stuff I'm asking it to do. So this is actually really good news for people who intend to play a lot of games on this thing. CPUs are definitely thermal throttling under sustained intense loads, but GPUs really aren't. On to the Lightroom export, and I had the computer export 688 raw images to JPEG. And this program, unlike the other benchmarks, lets both the CPUs and the GPUs work together. In Cinebench or in Draw Things, it was just one or the other. And in this test, with the MacBook in its factory default state, it hits 100 degrees Celsius in four seconds. It just blasts heat into there. The whole SOC package is receiving 40 watts and very immediately starts to throttle. Once everything levels out, it maintains the CPU at about three gigahertz and it's giving it between 25 and 27 watts of power. With the mod installed, and this again was surprisingly about the same with or without the puck. Looks like I really don't need this puck. So with the thermal pads, with or without this thing, both cases, the computer never hit 100 degrees. So I actually don't know why it throttled down the CPU. My guess is Adobe knows how hard this hits so it just like tones it down a bit by default. So it did throttle, but it did throttle a bit less. Once everything flattened out, this was running at about three and a half gigahertz and pulling between 28 and 30 watts. So really only a couple more watts, but this was able to finish that export, what, eight seconds faster than the default MacBook Pro. That's two minutes and five seconds versus one minute and 57 seconds with the thermal pads installed. Putting these thermal pads in here does not automatically void your warranty. Although if you mess anything up while taking the cover off, that probably does. Once you get all these screws off, there are two like snap button things here that you have to kind of pop up and then the case has to slide down before you pull it out. So you pull it down and out to get it off. And unlike with the MacBook Air, this dirty MacBook Air, where doing this mod actually bumps the performance by like 30%. On the MacBook Pro, it really only gives you maybe an eight to 10% of measurable difference in performance. And that's only for the amount of time that it takes for these fans to spin up, which is strangely slow for a Pro device. Overall, I think this is worth doing, unless you live in fear, which I know, Andy, a lot of people do. This isn't overclocking in the traditional sense. I'm not programming the computer to run faster than it was designed to. I'm altering the conditions that it's running in such that it on its own accord just decides to run faster while remaining in spec for its heat tolerances. This is a safe thing to do to your MacBook Pro. There are links in the description for all the materials I used. Goodbye.